Very happy to be joined by, uh, I, I guess, our national convention uh, correspondent, uh, as much as we can uh, put it that way, Alex Michelson from, <laughs> from Fox LA. He was at the RNC. I guess Midwest correspondent would be a good one, too, from being in uh, Wisconsin a couple months ago and now here uh, in Chicago. So I asked you uh, back in Chicago, I said, the issue is, uh, and you said unity uh, at the RNC. What is the issue uh, at the DNC? It seems could, like it could be a similar topic. Sure is. Uh, in both conventions, the party faithful left feeling confident that they were going to win and that we have a whole new race. Uh, so it, it, it was extraordinary um, how much everybody at the RNC just felt like the election was over and we're sort of measuring the drapes in the Oval Office and thinking about who Trump was going to fill out the cabinet with. Uh, J.D. Vance pick, which it was a pick that came from confidence, not necessarily looking for who would be the best swing state pick, but who, who he would want to work with and who the base really liked. Uh, and then, you know, two days later, Donald Trump uh, is completely sort of caught flat footed when Joe Biden uh, gets out of the race. Kamala Harris takes over. During the RNC, so many Democratic operatives thought that Kamala Harris would be a bad candidate, so much so that they wanted there to potentially be an open convention or be some sort of open process for there to be a different nominee. Kamala Harris unites the party within hours, makes 100 phone calls in 10 hours, shuts down everything. And then ever since, the, the Democratic word is unity. It was amazing to see. Uh, back after the debate with Joe Biden, polls show that of the de Democratic base, about 30 percent of them were happy with the nominee. Now those numbers are closer to 90 percent. That's a huge change, a huge switch. Uh, and people uh, back then during the Democratic uh, or Republican convention, Democrats were saying things publicly about their nominee, about how great he was, but saying very different things privately. And now you're seeing a lot of similarities between what is being said publicly and privately, which is that Democrats are, to, to quote Barack Obama, fired up and ready to go and want to get to work. And it seemed like one of the things that they uh, that maybe helps with unity the most is having uh, something that's very succinct and a good uh, set of talking points. And that's what we saw in the speech. Uh, perhaps succinct is the best term and maybe on on brand and, and, and on topic is the other one, because uh, watching your story, of course, last night, we, we saw that prompter that you had showed at the Republican National Convention, how someone veered away from it. And then as you were showing last night, and as everyone knew, knows with a 40 minute length speech, as opposed to what Trump had, this was a very fast and on topic and literally on script speech. And that Harris is, is a very disciplined person, as somebody who's known Kamala Harris for a long time in a lot of different jobs. She's been very um, disciplined. She's oftentimes been kind of cautious politically not to make unnecessary errors. It's part of the reason I think she hasn't really been talking to the media that much because she hasn't felt like she's needed to and she's been able to avoid some of those errors. And look, I mean, th there's, a, there's some folks on the right who see the fact that Trump goes off a script or something like that as, as a great strength, that he doesn't need prompter and all the rest of that. And, and there is an argument there. And obviously, we'd love to have more unscripted moments with Kamala Harris and hope she does our show again and does interviews with all of us and all the rest of that. But there's also an argument to be said that, look, this is the biggest, most important speech of your life. You're doing it in prime time. Everything is very carefully choreographed. And there's value in coming up with the speech that your team and everybody agrees on that you think is valuable and then going out and delivering that, that maybe that is isn't a moment you need to be off prompter and just coming up with something off the top of your head. And maybe that shows a lack of preparation uh, that you didn't get the work done to go execute in the moment that really matters. Um, all week long, the uh, Democrats had been running long uh, there wasn't that much discipline. And, and some of the most important primetime speakers were coming on the air after 11 p.m. Uh, on the East Coast. Last night, it seemed like the party went out of its way to get Kamala Harris on stage earlier and to get her off stage earlier at a time when more Americans were likely to tune in. What did you make of, of President Biden's speech at the beginning of the week? Because he starts the week and it sort of sets the tone and it seemed like it was his most uh, measured deliver uh, set of marks that he's delivered since the State of the Union. Was that a fair assessment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think he was, you know, he was passionate in what he was saying, and there was a lot of love from people in the room, but it's a really weird dynamic. I mean, all of these people um, who had supported him in the past and who have a lot of respect for him and love him, like really didn't want him to be the nominee and thought that he was going to lose. Um, and so for him to come there 
And, you know, it, it, it was sort of weird. The rest of the week, people would say his name like Barack Obama did and Jill, uh, Kamala Harris did and all the rest of it. And it was it was kind of felt a little bit like going through the motions. Like, yeah, we're supposed to say that. Joe Biden was great. Yeah. But then they would t talk about Tim Walls. Yeah, Tim Walls. <laughs> you know, like it was it, it felt like people were just so ready to move on from Joe Biden. I, I felt like it must have been uh, hard, kind of hard for him to watch. And especially the way that the Obamas framed this race and other people did too. this idea that hope is coming back. Hope is making a comeback. Well, implicit in that is the fact that the guy who is president right now, the guy who was your vice president, um, he's not hopeful <laughs> that there's not a feeling of hope now. Um, and, and so it, it seemed like the way throughout the week that Harris was framed as a successor to Barack Obama and not a successor to Joe Biden, who is currently president of the United States. Um, and, you know, Biden leaving the stage there on Monday, flying to California, going on vacation, literally not leaving his this place that he's staying at in Santa Inez. We haven't seen him. Uh, it's like he kind of disappeared for the rest of the week, which I think is how the Democrats want it, but he is still very much the president. And, and Harris seems to be running as a challenger, even though she's the incumbent vice president, treating Donald Trump like an incumbent. We're not going back. Um, and, and that's part of the advantage. Uh, the Democrats have all these advantages now that they didn't have with an 80 uh, plus year old nominee um, who has all the baggage of being president and didn't seem to be getting a lot of the uh, values of incumbency. Well, the one advantage that Republicans have, and we've heard how many Republican operatives talk about it this whole week, is that is, is the idea that, OK, okay, we can attach Kamala Harris to the issues that are currently affecting the country right now because she's the vice president. And then, of course, the ultimate question there is, do you have uh, someone on the other side or do you, is your is the person on top of your ticket the right person to make those attacks, uh, especially in a debate or just in the months leading up to the, the election as well? And I think that's the question with President Trump. Right. I mean, you know, look, the country was very clear throughout the entire year um, that they did not want to see a matchup between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And Nikki Haley uh, said this at the beginning of the year, uh, including in the interview that I did with her, the first party that ditches their nominee is probably the one that's going to win. <laughs> and, uh, and she may prove to be right on that front. Um, you know, Kamala Harris feels more fresh because the country doesn't know her as well and she hasn't um, been as vocal and and you know donald trump has been all consuming in our lives since he came down that elevator i mean if you think about it and this is part of the reason why they they're using you know turn the page we're not going back this idea that even though joe biden has been president donald trump has seemed to still be in the picture every step of the way think about joe biden's presidency right within the first few weeks of his presidency there's an impeachment trial for donald trump in the senate uh during his first 100 days we're still talking about donald trump he goes into exile for a little bit but then all these indictments come up on the trials him running for president him piping in on all the issues it's like he's never left the stage during this whole time. And Democrats hope uh, that if Harris beats Trump, that he may finally actually leave the stage. And not only can we move on um, from the Biden era in that generation, we can move to a new generation that we may be able to move towards a new era in American politics. Well, I know an era in American politics, lots of people want to see move towards is this uh, current debate that we have going on between what America should do in response to the Israel Hamas war. That was going to be the thought that Chicago was going to be overrun by protests this weekend. And you were there. I know that there were protests, but they didn't seem to have as big an impact on the DNC when those uh, free free Gaza banners were unfurled at the DNC. You had all the people with, I think, their state delegations or the or the we support Joe and we support Kamala um, uh Oh, what is it? The the, uh, the the signs that I can't think of what they're called. For they were, signs. Yeah, yeah the sign, all campaign that stuff. signs. Yeah. Just holding them up to kind of block that. And you had remarks from Kamala Harris that were much more pro-Israel than what we saw at the start of the week uh, with uh, President Biden and the message that he was putting out there as well. So that was something that was interesting to watch. And I heard the remarks yesterday from uh, from Representative Sherman in, in California who talked about the reason why they're at our event uh is because they know that we can win is essentially his message and the fact that no, that's a that's a bit that of true? a spin we know that donald trump so? could win could win too but i i think that uh look 
Um, th th there's no doubt that that issue, the issue of Israel is splitting the Democratic Party, being in the room. Um, it was the only issue where you didn't really see unanimity among people. Um, when she made the comment that was pro-Israel, there were some people that were hesitant and weren't necessarily standing or cheering for that. When she made her comment, which is a little bit more pro-Palestinian, that actually got a louder uh, applause in the room. Uh, but there were folks who were a little more pro-Israel who I saw were sitting on their hands and not standing up during that and that we're uncomfortable. I mean, it is clear that the Democratic Party is not on the same page on that, which is why she tried to basically make both arguments at the same time, if you're really listening to what uh, she was saying there. But uh, the protesters, although um, they were, you know, around, um, did not seem everywhere. There's so much security and such a large perimeter that you did, didn't really feel their presence actually at the convention. And so many of the Harris events and Biden events have been interacted by uh, protesters this year, but the, it's so complicated to get in and there's so much security and vetting to get in um, that those folks didn't seem to be able to get in uh, to the actual room. Um, you know, the, the, the entire week went pretty smoothly inside without a lot of disruption. And I think when you look at the Sherman comments too, and, and I think some of these comments too, without the spin on it, it's because they've been able to to do it on college campuses and, and create that environment where it's become a become where it's become a message that they are able to have that power. And then, as you said, with the, with the security measure that you saw in place, they weren't really able to have that same same type of effect this week. No, they they uh, they weren't at least inside the room. There were some protests outside uh, the room, but you know that issue is not going away, um, and it's. Uh, it's a challenging one uh, for for President Biden, um, and it's a it's a challenging one for Harris, who's who's kind of tied to what Biden is doing, but doesn't have the power of Biden to actually do it herself. And the last topic I wanted to talk to you about was the California takeaway. You also presented this in your stories as well, which is that uh, maybe very deliberate effort to not talk too much about California last night and specifically uh, maybe progressive issues as opposed to trying to lead in toward those swing states and try to win over voters that are going to deliver a victory through the Midwest. I mean, Kamala Harris is a daughter of the Bay Area who grew up and cut her teeth in uh, progressive San Francisco politics, which is a blood sport often. Um, and it often can be who's going to be the most progressive. Um, throughout her career, though, she has taken steps to try to avoid a lot of really controversial issues that could impact her down the road, which is turning out to be helpful for her now. But, you know, there, there was a lot of California throughout the week. Um, noticeably, we did not see an actual address from Governor Gavin Newsom. We saw addresses from a lot of other swing state governors, uh, but we didn't see him up on stage. He was the one who helped put her over the top uh, with the delegation making an address from the floor, but so did other governors when their states came up and then they still got addresses on the stage and Governor Newsom uh, did not. We heard a lot of from her friends and stuff over the years, but on that big final night uh, when people are paying attention the most, um, you did not see a lot of California or California policies on stage. You saw the governor of North Carolina, Roy Cooper. You saw the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, two states that uh, Democrats need to win or would like to win in the case of North Carolina. Um, you saw veterans, Mark Kelly from Arizona, Ruben Gallego from Arizona, who's in a close race there. Uh, you saw the veterans from Congress. You, you saw, you know, talk about issues that would appeal to folks in the middle, even when talking about, um, you know, freedom from uh, gun violence. The question is, what do you do about it? So that the themes on that that final night, we're very focused and very disciplined on swing state voters, which was not the case at the RNC. Um, Donald Trump was feeling confident, you know, concepts like, you know, we want to deport millions of people is not necessarily what swing state voters want to hear. Um, some of what J.D. Vance was talking about, some of the the culture issues are not necessarily what undecideds want to hear. This was very strategic in what they were doing uh, with this uh, night. Now, will they be able to keep that going? What will happen with the debate? What happens when she actually does do a sit down interview and has to talk about some of the policies? You know, those are big questions going forward. There's still a lot, lot of twists and turns. How does this Robert F. Kennedy situation impact things? We don't know. Um, but in terms of this week, was it a good week for the Democrats? It was a good week for the Democrats. It really couldn't have gone a lot better for Kamala Harris. But is is it for sure that she's going to win? No. Is it for sure that Trump's going to win? No. We really don't know. And one thing we've learned uh, to expect in this is there's probably more twists and turns that we can't even see coming. 
And I think that's the biggest point to note is that we normally see when we've had Trump these last two elections, you see Hillary Clinton leading in national polls by 10 percent, Joe Biden leading national polls by seven, eight percent. The national polls are showing this within a margin of error of about three or four percent, really tight, can go either way. And of course, it matters on the state levels, too. And of course, those are all all those swing states are still within that margin of error that it can go any way. We don't know how to predict it just yet. But what I do know is as much as I think I have to cut content down and fit it into a package or fit it into these specials that we're going to air over the next couple of weeks, man, I don't envy your job for for cutting all the DNC stuff into a uh, half hour show for the issue is. But uh, but that show, of course, airs on Fox 58 Bakersfield here at 6 a.m. on Sundays. It's a great way to start your day. Now, if you don't uh, if you like to sleep more than I think Alex and I do. Uh, you can also watch that on your on the website, foxla.com slash show slash the issue is. It's also on Apple Podcasts and other streaming services. And uh, look, are you going to be working on the plane on the flight back, flight back there? It probably will. Uh, you can yeah. check it out also on my YouTube page, youtube.com slash Alex Michelson. The advantage of, uh, in addition to doing the issue is, I also you know do the work for the local station in Los Angeles um, where we've been doing uh, hits at... Um, about 15 hits a day. So there's been plenty of places to put the content. <laughs> we put up the best stuff, which is good. Uh, so, But most of it has uh, has found a home somewhere when you have that many uh, hits and that many platforms. But it's been a remarkable week. I mean, here we've been able to talk with every major leader in, in the state, from the governor, lieutenant governor, and both senators, uh, almost all the members of Congress, plus, you know, um, a lot of iconic leaders, governors from other states, you know, uh, congressional leaders uh, on, on top of the delegates themselves, on top of what's fun at one of these conventions, which I'm sure you will probably end up going to the next one, is um, all the thought leaders and opinion leaders and journalists and commentators and all that all gathered in one place. And oftentimes they're more interesting to talk to than the politicians because they're not on uh, doing their talking points as much. So all of that is featured this week on The Issue Is. We hope people will uh, check it out and start following us and, and continue to follow your great work. Congrats on all your continued success, Will.